What a way to start a morning. The Gospel for this Sunday is written in the Gospel according to St. Luke, the 12th chapter. Would you rise, please? Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, who set me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly, and he thought to himself, What should I do, for I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods, and I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. The Gospel of the Lord. Good morning, Trinity. My name once again is Tom Cadle. I come to you from southeastern Pennsylvania. I live in a little town just outside of uh, Philadelphia, uh, an area of the Lutheran Church that was described one time by one church leader as the area in the church where Lutherans are the densest. <laughs> so I hope that uh, that doesn't show too much uh, um, in, in what I'm going to tell you about this morning. Um, <clears throat> my little town is called Harleysville. And uh, we are famous there for one thing and one thing alone, and that is that we do not build motorcycles there. I'm so glad to be with you this morning to have the opportunity to share with you about something that is so dear to my heart, which is service to the poor through an organization called Food for the Poor. This past Monday, my wife and I were headed someplace, and uh, we were walking down the driveway towards the car, and all of a sudden my wife just stopped, and she handed me her purse real quick, and she rushed over and pulled a, her phone out of her pocket, and then went over to this long flower garden that, that adjoins, the, uh, adjoins the driveway. She pulled out that phone, and all of a sudden she went up and she started taking a couple pictures. And she said, do you see that? And I looked at her, I, I didn't see really anything. And then she pointed out to me that butterfly. And as she did, she said, this is why gardeners garden. In a gardener's imaginations, they see things that aren't yet real things that are yet to come to bloom. So she quietly approached that butterfly, took those pictures, and her face was just lighted up with this wonderful smile. Now, I'm not a gardener. I occasionally pull weeds and dig holes, but gardeners are people who create beauty. Gardeners, like my wife Lois, have the wonderful ability to imagine things as they can be. Now, she hadn't seen those butterflies with her eyes until that very day, but she had seen them quite clearly in her gardener's imagination. Now, gardeners like God do the very same thing, only, of course, on a much grander scale. The world is God's beloved garden. It's a garden born in the vivid imagination of our God, and then spoken into its exalted glory with the simple words, let there be. 
And with those words, you and I and everyone and everything else began to bloom. But there's another thing my gardener wife knows and taught me about, is that there are certain plants, like the marigold, which ward off things that would destroy the beauty and productivity of a garden. And you know what? The divine gardener does the very same for God's wondrous garden that you and I bloom in. Divine marigolds surround us and protect us and allow us to bloom in God. In today's gospel text that I just shared with you, Jesus, prior to the beginning of that text, has been speaking to a large crowd of the poor and the oppressed and teaching them about how to draw their strength and their dignity from their God. When in the middle of this teaching, someone in the crowd interrupted him. Teacher, this guy says, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. Well, Jesus saw right through this rather jolting change of subject and pointed this man and the whole crowd to a beautiful marigold of God. And Jesus did it in a story. He wants us to know that there are certain life-sucking pests that attack us in this garden of God. One of those pests is the very human inclination to put our trust in the things that we own and to depend upon ourselves rather than depending upon God. And we soon then come to confuse our wants with our needs. And Jesus introduces that story with the warning. One's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. It says, as if he is saying, own your possessions, but be on guard that your possessions do not own you. The marigold in the garden protects us from being separated from true life, the true life that comes from being in God. And one of the things that most subverts life <clears throat> is to hang on to our possessions with a death grip. Now, have you ever reached your hand into a jar to grab hold of something and then found that you couldn't pull it back out because of the fist that you made to, to grab onto it. Life with God is not unlike that. Unless we release our grip on saving ourselves, we are not free to receive God's goodness. When we are freed to receive the protection of the marigolds of God's word, we experience gratitude of that protection. And then, in that gratitude, we miraculously become marigolds ourselves for the rest of God's garden and the wondrous life that inhabits it, every nook and cranny. I'd like to tell you about a beautiful bloom in God's garden and urge you to become her marigold. Her name is Marie Carmel. I met Marie a year ago this past June when I toured her very small, way, way, way out of the way village called La Perriere in the nation of Haiti, the poorest nation in the Western Hemisphere. Along with some others from Food for the Poor, I visited that village in order to get a sense of just how extreme the poverty is in that island nation. And it was, for me, a real eye-opener. The homes in this village were made of woven sticks and plastered with mud. The floors in these homes were dirt. 
Most of the homes were but one or two rooms, no matter the size of the family, and there was practically no furniture at all. And we learned that they would have to remud their homes after it rained. And that sometimes it actually took days for the indoor floors to dry out. So during that time, they slept in the mud. They sat and ate in the mud. They lived in the mud. There we met Marie Carmel. Marie spoke only her native language, which is Haitian Creole, a kind of mixture of French and some African dialects. And Marie walked out of her little thatched hut there and welcomed us with a big, broad smile and then called her children out to meet us. The children, I noticed right off the bat, had significant orange patches in their black hair. And later I learned that that coloring is a sign of severe malnutrition, the very same malnutrition which had already claimed four of Marie's children. But then Marie did a most remarkable thing. She began to sing. She began to sing a hymn. Eyes turned heavenwards. She sang and she sang. And the English words to that hymn I later learned were these. Every road I traveled down, you have walked before me, made the light to shine out of the darkness. I am looking for the day when I bow before you, lay my crown at your feet. O oh, Jesus, you are the king of who I am. Her skin and bone arms surrounded her children with tender love, and she sang. She sang to praise Jesus for remembering her. I was deeply moved. Here was this very weak woman praising God for her strength. This desperately poor woman praising her Lord for making her rich. Not in material things, but rich in the hope that her children would have food and proper shelter and medical care and clean water to drink and maybe, just maybe, even a little bit of education. She wanted these things for her children the same way any mother anywhere would want them for her own. Marie was praising God for marigolds like you and me. Food for the Poor is with Marie and with so many thousands upon thousands of others in the Caribbean and Central America. And Food for the Poor is with them so that they can know that God wants better for them. God is with them in the food that we send, in the houses that we can build, in the wells that we can dig, in the schools we can support, in the hospitals that we can get medicines to. And that, quite honestly, is why I am here this morning. I ask you to be a marigold for Marie and for her malnourished children and for so many thousands of others in the 17 nations of the Caribbean and Central America that are served by food for the poor. Now, Pastor Brom promised that there would be a quiz. Okay, this is it. Did everybody get a chance to look at this little, these little things? Didn't get over there. For those of you who did in particular, what are these things? Did you get a look at them? And by the way, if you get a chance, be sure to give them back to me after, after service because I've got to use them for next service too. Who's got a guess as to what these things are? 
What's that? Mud for building the hut. A very good guess, but wrong. <laughs> Who else would like to make a guess? Money. No, not money. Not money. Clay bowl. It does look like pottery, doesn't it? But no, that's not, not pottery. One more guess. Something food. You got it. This is lunch for Haitian children. You got little fragments of it, but these are called Haitian cookies. They're made out of clay, a little bit of bouillon, some salt, some oil. The mothers form them, they put them out in the hot Haitian sun to dry, and then they feed them to their kids. Now these are not stupid people. They know there's no nutrition in this whatsoever. But they give them to their kids to take away that desperate pain of hunger that they carry in their bellies. This is why food for the poor does what it does. Because there is poverty in this world that is so remarkably huge that it's hard to imagine. But we are blooming marigolds, protectors of that garden that God created and that God loves so dearly. And we can protect this wondrous garden through gifts to food for the poor. For generations now, God has protected these poor through people like you and so many others, and gifts have literally become God's marigolds for them. Every gift, whether it's large or small, blooms into God's promise. So much good has been done. Yet the need in the Caribbean remains unbelievably huge. This past year, food for the poor provided more than $1 billion worth of aid to these desperately poor. And we're still only barely scratching the surface. So today I'm here inviting you, urging you really, to be God's marigolds to these very special flowers. Let me tell you just a bit more about this organization, which I dearly love. Though other international aid organizations may be far more familiar to you, Food for the Poor is actually the second largest international aid organization in the United States. And you should know that more than 96 cents of every dollar that gets contributed goes directly to those that we serve. And we've been serving in the Caribbean for 34 years. There are lots of ways to bloom for them. Now, in your bulletins this morning, you received a little brochure that looks like this. And if you have a chance to look at this, you can get a pretty good idea of some of the ways that we can assist people. Notice in that brochure the Angels of Hope program where you can actually adopt an orphan for just $34 a month. Or you can go to the Food for the Poor website at foodforthepoor.org and find there dozens upon dozens upon dozens of other projects, miracles really, which you might choose to embrace. Everything from building a house, a lot of congregations go together to do that, to providing clean water that isn't tainted and makes people sick, to buying a goat, and so many other things. Some efforts appear so small, like just filling an envelope. But what comes out of this envelope is a huge miracle for God's weak and poor children. So won't you join me today and be a marigold in God's precious garden? 
If you do choose to make a gift of food for the poor, you can do so today. Just put it right in that envelope, and you can give that to me right at the door. And uh, tomorrow morning, first thing, I will have that on the way down to our headquarters in Coconut Creek, Florida. Or if you choose, you can mail it in. You'll notice there's a little number stamped right on the, the address side of that envelope. That literally says Trinity Lutheran Church. So anytime that you want to make a gift and send it in that envelope with that number on it, it's going to be credited to your congregation. But one thing I want to just call your attention to is the section that's titled, Let Us Pray For You. And then you'll see on the back there's a place where uh, you can write prayer requests if you choose. Every day at Food for the Poor, 2,000 of these prayer requests come in the mail. And you know what? We have 300 employees there. And before they do anything else that day, any other tasks, the very first thing that's done is that those 2,000 prayer requests are prayed by our staff. And if people include their name and a telephone number, our staff will even call and have those prayers with you right on the phone. This is a profoundly Christ-centered organization, profoundly mission-driven to serve God by serving God's poorest people. So I thank you today for having me here. I got here well after the sun was down last night, and I haven't had a chance to see Eau Claire yet, but I'm going to have a little bit of a chance here. But what I did see just coming here this morning, looks like you've got a wonderful, little, or wonderful city here, and I can't wait to see more of it. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for inviting Food for the Poor to become a part of your ministry. Amen. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.